Okay, well, thank you for coming over. Um, I feel like I'm living in the future. I mean, I've done Zoom, but it's interesting to, to uh, be um, in this way. So it is 5 p.m. here. I guess it's 7 p.m. there. So I hope you've had a, a good day. Um, people that know me know that I do this little practice before I sit, I call the bridge. And uh, when I was a monk, we always chanted. Uh, in some traditions, they bow. In some traditions, they walk. Because I feel that, you know, you have your day, your week, and all of a sudden, you're going to silence. And that transition sometimes is a little difficult. So let's just do a tiny bit of movement. So if you can, uh, if you are physically able, put your fingers on your uh, shoulders. And with your elbows, make some nice circles. Sort of three to four times one way, and three to four times the other way. Take some nice deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. I know masks are not comfortable. <sighs> Put your right hand on your left knee and just give a very gentle spinal twist. Take a deep breath in and breathe out back to center. And a deep breath in, other side. Deep breath in, and a deep breath out, back to center. So being grateful for the Ohlone people of the San Francisco area and all indigenous group, Ojibwe, that have stewarded the land. Being grateful for the Sangha, I have so much love for common ground and the privilege that we have enough time, enough health to be able to practice. Throughout the years, I have noticed that whether subtly or not subtly, people want to relax when they meditate. Sometimes it's an unconscious or some unnamed wish that the meditation be a pleasant experience. And as many of us know, meditation can be all sorts of things. When teachers say open to the present moment, I used to think, okay, well, if I open to this unpleasant feeling, then Maybe it'll get better. Whether in patience endurance, patient endurance, kantiko bhavana, the cultivation of patience is good enough. So if that happens to you today, that's a blessing. If something pleasant happens, that is a blessing. And we can take the route of having a anchor, like your breath, or we can have open awareness. But whatever we do, just to invite humility, to invite you know, just an openness. to how things are at this very moment. So let's start finishing the, start to finish the bridge, which is just listen to the sounds that you hear in the room of Common Ground. Let's take a couple of minutes to use your ears And just be aware of the sounds outside of the building and inside of the building. Just listen.
Just know how you listened with your ears. Let's do a body awareness. Let's start with the sitting bones. Feeling the contact of the cushion or the chair. Listening to your right foot. What information are you getting from your right foot right now? Let's switch with loving attention to your left foot. Is this sensation unpleasant? Is the sensation on your left foot pleasant? Is it neither or is it both? What information can you gather in your left foot? What is it touching? Just with the same quality of listening, it's just there. Not a lot of effort, just, just listen. We know the spine is such an important part of our bodies. What information are you gathering from your spine just at this very moment? In the lower back area. There's something unpleasant. Allowing compassion to come in, which is wishing that part of my body healing. You should travel through the spine, go to the middle of your back. Now listen to your upper back. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, mixture. The right shoulder could talk to you, what would it say? Now listen to the left shoulder. This body that changes. Maybe you've heard that time is an illusion and time and space is this matrix and blah, blah, blah. And we have this clock. 
we have the moon, we have the earth that's a clock, and we have this body. It has a beginning in youth, it has a middle, and it has an end. Because his body is this clock, we can get attached to the concept of time. So what is this clock experiencing right now? How can an entire system be receptive? Like an old fashioned satellite dish can get any programs in there, mysteries, tragedies, telenovelas, comedies, music. What is your system experiencing right now? It's like a curiosity, no effort needed, no medals being given tonight. the thoughts that get registered. For something to be an emotion, it has to be felt in the body. If there is an emotion in the body, in the mind, citta in Pali, what is that emotion? And how can we lovingly listen to it? As we continue this time in community and in silence, pick an anchor if you need it. Loving kindness, continue paying attention to your body. Just if you pay attention to your hands for the next 20 minutes, it's quite interesting. But continue to have this openness, this awareness, this receptivity.
as we wind down our time in silence, let's all do a community anapanasati, awareness of our breath. So if you need to finish whatever practice you were doing, do that. And just how you have the ability to listen to the sounds inside and outside. Let's finish as a community paying attention, listening to our breath. The symbol of life. This is what is keeping us physically here, this breath. What is the quality of the inhalation today, this moment? Notice the space between the inhalation and the exhalation for a couple of rounds. Just pay attention to that. Pause. We'll give particular attention to the exhalation. And all the places in your being where the breath is registering. Isn't that beautiful? We have nothing to do right now except listen to the breath. What I mean by listening is this loving attention. We have this beautiful privilege right now to notice how we inhale, the transition before the exhalation. That's all. Not demanding to relax, not demanding for anything, just paying attention. In what places is that inhalation being registered in your consciousness? And as we finish, taking a time to consider common ground and all the people that make it happen, all the resources that common ground provides to the community. Bring to mind the blessings of your life. If you know that you will probably have food tomorrow, picture where that food is. Is it in a refrigerator, on shelves? Just take it to heart how beautiful it is to have some food.
thinking of the clothing that protects you and covers you. Do you have a closet with clothes? And just be mindful that this is a blessing. If you have more than one pair of shoes, Picture the ceiling and the roof of the shelter that you usually have. In Spanish, it's just one word, techo. So if you've got a techo, taking that blessing into your heart. If you've got some medicine, Maybe you don't have everything that you need, but is there something that helps your healing? Bring that into your mind. For everything else, maybe you're fortunate enough to have one person that cares about you in your life. Bring that person to the room next to you. Maybe somebody that has passed. If you've been fortunate enough to love someone in this lifetime, just take them into your heart. And with that, Take your final breaths as we finish this communal silent time. And when you feel comfortable, open your eyes if they were closed. And as I go get a drink, please stretch if you need to. I really wish I were there. My husband Lance is in Minneapolis right now and he invited me to go. And I said, no, because I'm a school teacher and there are no substitute teachers to be found. So I just thought it's too much of a hassle to be here, um, to, to travel. I mean. <laughs> How's my volume? Should I speak louder or can you hear me well? Okay, perfect. So I'm at home. Uh, am I correct that you finish? Okay, so if it's 7.40 at 8.30, is that correct? Okay, so I am going to have to leave at 8.25 your time because uh, I am meeting a friend. We're going to go see a Dion Warwick documentary uh, at our local movie theater here in the Castro in San Francisco. Um, I don't know much about my work, but I thought I haven't been in a movie theater in a long time. So even if it's with a mask, it's good. I was thinking uh, the other day, uh, how we can get really sophisticated in spirituality and or sometimes gimmicky or, um, you know, make spirituality be something interesting. And in Buddhism, 
especially in early Buddhism, sometimes there's just these kind of very grounded, kind of not very exotic. I remember when I was a young man, I used to love Hinduism. I went to India when I was 20. Actually, I turned 21 there. And um, Krishna is just full of jewels and the, the, all the singing of Hinduism and the flowers and the colors. And I found Buddhism and I, I thought, this is the most boring religion I've ever come across. Ajahn Sumedho um, spoke at a university I was in. This is when I was a, a junior in England. And uh, I thought, these guys are really boring. And now that I'm not 20 years old anymore, it's something that has really stuck and serves me on my daily existence is this, this presentation of the tripod where you have sila, samadhi, and panya. And if you've heard it a thousand times, that's okay. The choir needs, pre needs practice. So I'm preaching to the choir. And sila, the, you know, the word, it means conduct. So you could have the sila of an elephant or the sila of a person. And then it later um, meant integrity. In Victorian English translations, virtue. We don't really talk about being virtuous anymore. And I've been thinking of the five precepts as this privilege as well. Like, you know, when I was a kid, there was a war in El Salvador. And there are people who had to decide whether they were going to kill someone to protect other people. And today, and all of my life, I've never had to be in a situation where I have to question whether I'm going to kill someone, murder someone. And to really take that in, Ajahn Sumedho used to talk to us when we were monks, young monks, because we used to get depressed or bored or you know horny or distracted. And he was like, are you keeping the precepts? That's all you have to do. And in Buddhist cosmology, if you keep the precepts, you are in the human realm. In my uh, BIPOC group, Black, Indigenous, and People of Color group, uh, I had done a year-long reflection on the first discourse of the Buddha, which is the quintessential teaching and something that is really close to my heart. And we're finishing with cosmology. And so I already gave the talk on the hell realms, the animal realms, the hungry ghosts and the angels and the gods, it's kind of fun. And to be in the human realm, you keep the five precepts because every cosmology level is paired up to a psychological or physical state. So the animal realm is the realm of fear and sexuality and greed, you know, because if you're in the forest, you've got to make a baby before someone eats you, right? <laughs> and the hungry ghosts, And the angels who are interested in music or the gods that are interested in creating and there's angels that are protective. But you know, being human is very non-glamorous. You follow the five precepts. And so if you have the privilege of not steal, you know, my mom, when I was a little kid in El Salvador, went to visit my aunt in, in Edina. And I would look at these pictures and she had written Edina. I'm like, where is this Edina in Minnesota? And she used to say, you know, the kids will leave their tricycles outside and nobody steals them. And I was like, what? How is that possible? How can someone just leave toys in the, in the front yard and not get stolen? Well, if you have all your needs met, it's not so tempting. So to take that blessing, you know, that if you don't get the mind of a thief, just how it's described in Pali, that's a great blessing. And communication is so hard nowadays. You know, what is the intention of that text, of that email, of Zoom? And if you are vigilant, or at least have the intention 
to say the right thing to the right person in the right place at the right time, like, like that kind of stuff. It's hard to know the intention. And when we don't follow it, how do we do that? I don't know if you've had this experience, many people have, where something gets, gets said and you can apologize a thousand times and it can never, you can never take it back, right? So what is right communication in this world of ours with Instagram and Facebook and our sexual energy? Is there shame? Is there greed? But you know, if we haven't abused someone in a sexual way or, or transgressed, all of those things, all of those precepts, not as some commandment, but as guidelines. And when I look at my life now, where I don't have major regrets of evil things, you know, and, and, and there's no evil thing. People make mistakes. And we have a justice system in this world, in, in, in this country specifically, where people get judged by their biggest mistakes and they get put in boxes. And so this leg of the tripod is not about being saintly, but you know, being grounded. And if we have those privileges where the, the, the precepts come easy, then gives a space for the other two, which are wisdom and uh, samadhi. And mindfulness and meditation, you know, here when I'm in California, when I moved from Minnesota to California, I was, I could not believe the materialism in, in some of the meditation communities. My favorite one was this, ad and a shop to learn to meditate and he had nine asterisks of all the things that will happen your anxiety will be gone you will sleep better you will relax like it had all these things and that may be true but to start off meditation practice by thinking of all the things you will get i i don't think it's sustainable because meditation can be such hard work. <laughs> and you know, as I've, now that I've over 30 years of meditating and I see the valleys and the things of, you know, of my life where sometimes I was, you know, really rigid about keeping a certain amount of minutes at a, and, and there's, there's something really beautiful about having a ritual that you do it at the same time. But as a competitive 20 something, sometimes I would be like, oh, I'm gonna do this. And uh, I actually wanted to get enlightened. I thought that this was a thing. Like what gets enlightened? Your personality? <laughs> like it's just, as Ajahn Sumedha says, it's just the Buddha knowing the Dhamma. That is, that is, the definition of enlightenment, this present moment. And the reason why I look at the body and the moon and the earth as a clock is because when you really fully surrender to the present moment, um, it's the simplicity and in this society that we live in, something that is our birthright has become incredibly rare. And it's something now that people will get into that materialistic thing. Oh, I want to feel the present moment. I want to have unity consciousness. I want to have God consciousness. I want to have, you know, da, 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 da. You should see the the places where they sell marijuana products in my neighborhood. They look like luxury galleries, you know, where people want to get out of their daily experience. And this leg of the tripod of 
bhavana of cultivation of the mind, it's not just sitting on the cushion. The reason why you want to be mindful the rest of the day is so that when you sit in the cushion, your bridge doesn't have to be that long, you know? So I always used to take the bus to work. Now I drive and sometimes I'm just like, okay, no radio. I don't need to know what the Biden administration is doing or what NPR has to say. But every stop sign will be my, there's a lot of stop signs. My work is three and a half miles from where I am and it takes me 20 minutes, 25 minutes in the city. And the driving at the moment is my practice. And when I was taking the train to Oakland every day, all the stressed out office people coming from Oakland to downtown San Francisco would be my mindfulness training where I would look at their faces and just wish them safety and wish them basically sending a little bit of love. And mindfulness as an invitation, a listening. You know, after all of these years, it has, I'm convinced that you just can't be mindful and order. It's not like you call Grubhub or a service. It's like, bring me some mindfulness. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> and so we can do all of these techniques. And uh, I've been counting my steps a lot recently, which it's, it's new, you know, as I, as I go through the years, different things come, you know, that there was a time and, I, and, and when I talk at common ground, whatever's happening in my life, that's what I talk about. But I was doing this mudra meditation where my hands would just do these things spontaneously to move the energy out of my body. I haven't done mudras in a couple of years. And I, I say this to you so that you discover your meditation and that your meditation discovers you. And maybe you've been meditating for 20 years and that's beautiful. And so continue that. And as you listen, um, things get revealed. When I went to Catholic school as a kid, they used to say, oh, God spoke to Moses. I'm like, how did he speak? Like, it's not telephone. How does God speak to anybody? But now I get it. <laughs> and, um, and to relax into um, well-being. You know, so I look at my day today. I met a friend. And then... I watch TV for like two hours. I just got absorbed into just being in bed, watching TV, I was gonna read the paper and I could have done all sorts of useful things. So I don't have to be like, I have to be mindful. And this, this play of like, what is it that is needed? You know, I'm, I'm working with teenagers who are under a lot of stress, who are feeling anxiety, us teachers are tired. So watching TV is perfect. But when you read some of the scriptures, when you read Ajahn Chah or people that went to Thailand, you know, Ajahn Chah was teaching young farmers. And so he was really strict to say, okay, you have to wake up at three in the morning. You have to do this, you have to do this. And that teaching doesn't translate in this context. And I don't, I don't do the East-West translation. I, it actually annoys me because what is the Southern world? You know, to divide spiritual wisdom into East and West is erasing the experience of Aboriginal people, of Native people, of Sub-Saharan African people. And all of this wisdom has existed in every tradition. Enlightenment was not invented by India. And it is her birthright to know the mind. It's the mind is peaceful. 
and with all the things going at my work, you know, like I have these two boys with ADHD that drive me crazy in my classroom sometimes. And that's, that's life. And the more centered I am, I've started doing M&Ms in my class before every class. Okay, it's time for M&M. It's a mindfulness moment. And sometimes I'm, okay, guys, take your toes, write your full name with your toes in the air. And that was our mindfulness moment. And half of them don't do it, but I do it. And so every hour I'm doing an M&M in my world. And that's a new practice. And that's, what can you do? You know, how can you become curious about how to bring mindfulness here and there. And the inter, I've been so fascinated by the, in, the interweaving of, of these three aspects, sila, samadhi, and panya. And if you are wise and you have mindfulness, that's gonna help your sila. You will get to a point where you're communicating. There's, you know, I went to a training with these nuns, I'm on the board, these bhikkhunis, Ayananda Bodhi, who has been to Minneapolis, I think. And we're just talking about what is nonviolent communication. And we read the book. And then wisdom, the, the third leg of this tripod, which is the more difficult, you know, because you, you'll read a scripture and it says, wisdom is knowing the Four Noble Truths. And that can be easy in the head, right? So you have the Ayurvedic medicine framework. There is a disease. And there's a cause for this disease. And you have a prognosis. And you have your treatment. So that framework is being used to present the human condition. And that the first noble truth is that everything that we come in contact with just happens to be impermanent and will not give you lasting pleasure. So as I love, I love really good chocolate, really good chocolate. Like I think Hershey's takes like wax. I've become a chocolate snob. But how much chocolate can I possibly eat? before it becomes dukkha <laughs> for anything. You know, people that are wealthy enough to be on vacation the entire time. I remember touring Europe and I said, oh, another church. Where everything in our experience, we have this thing of, it's not who we are will not give us 100% pleasure, and it is impermanent. That's just the way it is. That's the first noble truth. And then the cause of this suffering that we have out of this, because we have existence, that's it. There is dukkha. Like, fact, I don't like the translation, life is suffering. I don't think that's a, a nice translation. It's more like Dukkha's around, Dukkha's here, Dukkha's experienced. And the cause is not wanting the present moment to be what it is. I want a better relationship. I want the roof not to be leaking. I don't want climate change. And becoming idealistic can be problematic because perhaps you will never experience contentment. And contentment is, in my mind, a super high spiritual achievement. It is not a passive thing, it is seeing what you have, and that's it. You're resting. This is what I have. 
right now, I am not demanding that my husband be someone who he is not. I am not demanding that I be in a different planet where the extinction is not happening. I'd much rather be in a planet where everybody's taking care of the other creatures. But I can't switch planets right now. Maybe I will be able to have that choice, you know. <laughs> There's future life. Guru Krishna Loka. Loka just means planet in Sanskrit. And in Pali. Krishna's planet is really pretty. There's all these cows with jewels and they're running around. And everybody looks really pretty. And in Buddhist cosmology that says, you know what, even Krishna's planet has the three characteristics. And so this leg of the tripod to say, I understand how it is, and I'm going to invite a way of being in the world where I can reflect what it is like to not demand. And that's different from you know, I, I hurt my thumb with a hammer. Oh, I'm just going to see. No, you go and help your, your thumb, you know? You, if you get a thorn, and you take it out, it's responding, you know? It's, it's, not, it's not being passive. Like I've gone to therapy, I've gone to, you know, when I switched schools and it was so stressful, I had to go to this healer to help me out. And that's not some idealistic thing of like, oh, I'm just, I'm going to feel contentment with my anxiety. No, if you're sick, you feel medicine. It's, it's responding to the world. It's so different than this um, this conflict that I can have with life. And of course, the, the treatment, the recipe for life is this Noble Eightfold Path. And Buddhism is all about organizing in the scriptures, right? You have the three aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. And, you know, with right view and right intention, right speech gets there. And, and you have meditation again. And um, I remember the moment when I was reading the scripture where I said to myself, is a lifetime long enough to really study this Noble Eightfold Path and these truths? Um, because I had graduated from college and, and I really had this idea that spiritual practice was like, you could get a diploma, you know? <laughs> Actually, some people give diplomas for stream enterer and so on. And so just going back to the basics uh, has been very helpful for me uh, because we can hear about spiritual pirouettes, you know, spiritual sophistication. And people can do this and people can do that. And at the end of the day, when you wake up and we move in this world, there is a monk, Ajahn Lee, I think, in Thailand. And I've talked about this before, um, Common Ground, where they talk about people who don't practice. And again, going back to cosmology with colorful language, that if you're not practicing, your demons don't come. And as soon as you start practicing, the demons come. And they say, it's kind of like when you owe money to your neighbor and then the neighbor knows that you have absolutely no money, they don't knock on your door. But if they know that you won the lottery or that uh, you know, all of a sudden you have some money, then they will come. And I think with the mind can be like that, where if someone is just living with distractions, all they're doing is distracting the mind. And all of a sudden you stop, the mind will not just all of a sudden bliss out. 
So to answer your question without my life is seeing this connection of my daily life to the cushion. A lot of people that begin meditation and stop um, can be because they got promised relaxation or they got promised something and then they didn't get it after two years. I'm like, well, why should I do this? <clears throat> there are many things where um, <clears throat> meditation is not seen as something that will give me this gift. For example, devotion. You know, I notice in the theistic religion where you have an outward focus and you're praying to Kali or to Allah, and it's not about you. And the mind can really quiet down. And this practice is around the day where you can do something where you bring mindfulness, will help you in the cushion. Also, throughout my life, I've used beads. So my meditation beads can be a really good anchor. So do walking meditation and then do 108 lengths. Or I sit and I do 108 breaths. Or I think of 108 names throughout my life that I can send metta. So when the mind is having challenging emotions and at that moment, you don't wanna give attention to the challenging emotion and you need an anchor, um, things like chanting and beads and bowing. You know, child's pose and bowing to the ground, you know, the way Muslims do, is really good for your uh, parasympathetic system. <clears throat> and because we live in a materialistic society, the message is there that meditation will calm you down. And I don't know how many times I've seen it in the last five years where, oh, you want to be healthy? Eat right, exercise, floss, meditate. <laughs> they throw in meditate. And there are so many apps. And yes, you know, you can listen to your little talk and all that, but Meditation is so much more than a relaxation exercise or um, when a challenging emotion comes in to then invite wisdom. Is this a message where what I need is psychotherapy? Is what's bringing up with me something that I need journaling? And I've done that, you know, like right now I'm journaling in the morning. And as I look at my journaling life, I haven't journaled every single year of my life. But to process those emotions only in the cushion would be a mistake because I have so many thoughts that when I write in the morning, that's where those, some of those thoughts stay there. So by the time I get to the cushion, they've already been processed a little bit. Then I do my bridge, you know, which is a little bit of bowing, a little bit of yoga. So to answer the question is, Find your bridge. <clears throat> Is there something that you can do? You know, we don't have a society that does chanting or humming or dancing. And, uh, you know, at the monastery, we would chant for 20 minutes before we went into silence. And I would be so bored sometimes, you know, again, I was like 26 when I was in England. And, uh, with whatever's happening and also know that those things that are coming up, that's what requires attention. And the difference between suppressing, I don't want those thoughts, you know? And maybe you're the type that will never relax in meditation and is that okay? Pema Chodron talks about that. And she says, oh, I'm not a skilled meditator. World famous Buddhist teacher, best-selling author. Says I guide meditation, but my mind doesn't quiet naturally. And there are four types of practitioners. 
the ones who progressed rapidly and easily, and the ones who progress rapidly, but difficult and difficult, and then slowly and easy and slowly and difficult. And depending on the year, the day, you might be into one of those four. And having this kantiko bhavana, what does it mean to have patient endurance? That that's enough. We live in a society where patience is not celebrated. America adores convenience. And so why should a meditation be convenient? You know, you have to go against the habitual mind and against the cultural norm. And may you be well, happy, and safe, and may your loved ones be happy and safe. And this is something I say to my groups in meditation. Every time that you work towards your happiness, you are honoring everybody who loves you. Everybody who has ever loved you, what they want is for you to be happy. So when you work towards your happiness, you're honoring your ancestors, you're honoring the people that have loved you, and you're giving hope to the young ones. So with that, I leave you. Bye-bye.